Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you've all had a good week. So the case we are covering today, I discovered not too long ago actually. And one night I was just sat relaxing, which honestly is a rarity, but I was sat relaxing and I put on a true crime drama. I know, even when I'm relaxing, I am watching true crime. I literally am obsessed. So I put on this true crime drama called The Widower. Never heard of it before, didn't know anything about it, didn't know what to expect but I was instantly gripped. The TV show was based on the case of Malcolm Webster and oh my God, this man makes my blood boil. The best way to describe Malcolm Webster is he was the Tinder swindler for some reason. I always struggle to say Tinder swindler. I can't say it. My brain always wants to say Tinderla Swindler and I don't know why. Why does my brain work like this? Yeah, the best way to describe Malcolm Webster is he was the Tinder Swindler before Tinder. And unfortunately, in the case of Malcolm Webster, the consequences to his actions were far worse. He completely used and abused women. He went from one woman to the next, to the next, taking everything that he could from them. And he was doing this for decades and just getting away with it. Malcolm is a manipulator, a narcissist, a gaslighter, and he is literally the definition of a psychopath. And I do not use that word lightly. So yes, Malcolm Webster makes my blood boil. I am going to be so frustrated during today's case. And just to prepare you, Sassy Danielle is going to come out, which I know all of you don't mind because you all love a good sassy Sunday. And there are a lot of twists and turns in this case. So let's just jump in. I'm just jumping in here real quick because we do have a sponsor. So thank you so much Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service that has over three thousand documentaries and they have documentaries on pretty much every genre every topic under the sun they have history science travel lifestyle lots of stuff on animals which i love but of course they have lots of documentaries on true crime and i am true crime obsessed no surprise there but even when i'm relaxing i love to watch true crime documentaries and magellan tv add true crime documentaries to their service all the time. So there is always something new for me to watch. Like literally just the other day, I was browsing through the true crime section looking for something new to watch. And I saw a new documentary called Sleepwalkers Who Kill. And I was like, what? Instantly intrigued because I was like, oh my God, Sleepwalkers Who Kill? Like that's crazy. And I was right, the documentary was very crazy. I mean, come on, Sleepwalkers Who Kill. But it was fascinating at the same time because it's almost like, are you responsible for what you do if you sleepwalk and kill someone? Like what happens? And that is literally what the documentary tries to figure out. How much responsibility do these people have that kill people whilst they're sleepwalking, which I still cannot get over because that is terrifying. The documentary also speaks to a few people that have incredibly dangerous forms of sleepwalking. It's honestly so bizarre. It really is. Like there was this one man that woke up and he was strangling his wife, like full on strangling wrangling his wife and he kept attacking his wife constantly but he was asleep it's just mind-blowing okay and then there was this other woman and they showed this clip of this woman who was sleepwalking and she went down to the kitchen and she prepared herself a whole meal how do you do that so yeah the world of sleepwalking is bizarre in itself but then when you add violence to it it's Whew, on a whole nother level. So if you love true crime documentaries like I do, Magellan TV is definitely the place for you and you should check out Sleepwalkers Who Kill. Magellan TV is completely ad-free and starts for as little as $4.99 a month. But best of all, Magellan TV is offering every single one of you a full one month free trial. No strings attached, no contracts, cancel at any time. So if you guys wanted to take advantage of that absolutely incredible offer, go get yourself one month free of Magellan TV. I will leave a link in the description box or you can go to try.magellantv.com forward slash Danielle Kirsty. Thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video and keeping me entertained with all of the documentaries because I love a good documentary. But thank you to every single one of you watching right now because without all of you, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. Malcolm Webster was born on the 18th of April, 1959, making him an Aries. He grew up in Guildford, Surrey in the UK. And yes, we are in the UK again today. I don't think I've ever 
done two UK cases back to back, which is crazy when I think about it. For some reason, I just keep coming across so many cases from the UK that are one, unbelievable, two, I didn't have a clue about, and three, are crazily undercovered. So yes, I do have a few more UK cases coming up. I'll spread them out a little bit, but yeah, there are quite a few UK cases where I'm just like, really what the hell so malcolm was one of three children and malcolm was a twin he had a twin sister called caroline and i don't know why i feel like that is important i just feel like yeah he's a he's a twin and he also had an older brother called ian malcolm's parents were alexander and odette webster and they were both police officers mm -hmm. which is a uh, unbelievable but then very believable at the same time given what Malcolm goes on and does and the fact that he gets away with it. His mom was a police officer for only a short time and then later on in life she does become a nurse again kind of significant but Malcolm's dad was a detective chief superintendent in the Met Police in London so he had a very high up job high up role in the police had a lot of influence a lot of power definitely plays a part in this case. I'm just going to say that right now. And Malcolm's dad, not a good person, let's just say. He was a very, very strict disciplinarian. Malcolm did not have it easy in the house at all. And both of Malcolm's parents have actually been described as very cold, very distant. Neither one of them showed any of the children any kind of love, affection, friendship, none of that. They were just very strict parents but Malcolm's dad in particular was very very strict it said that he ruled the house with an iron fist he was the kind of parent that would always point out the flaws of his children he would always say things like stand up straight fix your posture elbows off the table tuck in your shirt queen's english only and as you can imagine with a parent like that nothing is ever good enough nothing they always see the faults and the flaws in everything that you do meal times in the household were also held in complete silence and the children were only ever allowed to talk if they were addressed directly by their father which almost never happened but what made the situation for malcolm even worse at home is that he was also the least favorite child. Malcolm's two siblings always received way more praise than he did. Even if they did the exact same thing, they would get way more praise than Malcolm would. Malcolm never really received any recognition, any praise. He was always seen as a failure, as a disappointment. So that was the kind of environment that Malcolm grew up in, which did have a very significant impact on his life. I mean, of course it did. That was not exactly the nicest or the healthiest environment to grow up in. I feel like if we've ever done a case where the person has daddy issues, it is this one. But then there was also this extremely bizarre, I don't even know what you want to call it. It wasn't a characteristic fact, strange fact. I don't know. There was just this really strange thing about Malcolm's dad as well, which to be honest, has no real relevance to the case, but I just had to include it. Okay. Because it is so bizarre. So Malcolm's dad had this very weird quirk do we even want to call it a quirk where whenever he needed to use the bathroom everyone in the house had to leave he demanded that nobody else should be in the house when he went to the bathroom i know extreme so literally odette malcolm's mom had to evacuate the house she also had to take all the children out of the house as well and this would happen no matter what the weather was like outside. If there was a snowstorm, for example, it didn't matter. Odette and the children had to bundle up in coats, layers, and leave the house whilst Malcolm's dad had to use the toilet. It's just crazy that every single member of their household had to physically be outside of the house for Malcolm's dad to use the toilet. And I do 100% get that sometimes these issues, quirks, whatever you want to call them that we all have, sometimes they can't be helped, you know? But I think in the case of Malcolm's dad, Malcolm's dad was not a very nice person. So even though he has this quirk, let's just call it a quirk, even though he had this quirk, he didn't care that he was inconveniencing other people. He didn't care that he was making all of the household physically leave the house while he went to use the bathroom. He didn't care at all. And it comes to a point where if these quirks are affecting other people in a negative way, like Malcolm's dad's quirk was, 
it's kind of like, do you not think you should work on it, you know? Malcolm had, as we can all imagine, not the best time at home, but his life at school was also not easy. Malcolm at school was described as a bit of a loner, a little bit strange. He didn't really have many friends, but he was also a massive attention seeker, which to be honest, makes complete sense to me because he's not getting any attention at home. So he's looking for ways to get attention elsewhere. And there are two very significant ways Malcolm would get attention in school. And these are very significant, play a big part in today's case. So the first way Malcolm would get attention in school was with fire. He would start fires, literally just start fires. He was obsessed with fire. At any opportunity at home, at school, just out in the world, if there was an opportunity to start a fire, Malcolm would. And he had been like this from the age of seven. And Malcolm didn't hide this from anyone. Everyone seemed to know about his obsession with fire, so much so that his nickname at school was Pyro. And we all know what they say when children are obsessed with fire and like to start fires, don't we? So that was the first significant way that Malcolm would get attention at school. But then the second significant way is that Malcolm liked to fake illnesses. He was that person that always pretended to be sick. And this was all the time. This was not just once in a blue moon or anything like that. This was all the time to try and gain attention and sympathy. And he would always do it to try and worm his way out of doing things that he didn't want to do. Now, listen, I know he's a child right now. He's in school and we have all done this. We have all faked an illness. We have all said that we have a headache or we're not feeling too good, or we feel a bit sick, we're gonna throw up. We have all done it at least once. I don't care, we have. We have all done it to try and get out of something that we don't wanna do at school. Malcolm took it to the extreme. He was the one that every single day there was something wrong with him. And he would do it at home as well. He wouldn't just do it at school. So if Malcolm's parents ever asked him to do chores, he had a headache. If his teacher at school ever asked him a difficult question, he would pretend to faint. It's like, can you imagine the teacher saying, Malcolm, what's the answer to, I'm trying to think of a difficult math question here, like X plus Y divided by three plus 21. You know, I don't even know if that makes any sense. It's like, can you imagine if the teacher asked Malcolm that question and Malcolm would just be sat there like, uh, uh, and then faint. It's like, what the hell? He also faked having dyslexia in school. He faked pretty much having everything, but it didn't stop there. Oh no, no, because Malcolm would also tell his friends that he had a brain tumor just so he could see their shocked reactions. So basically the moral of the story is that Malcolm is a compulsive liar, compulsive attention seeker, and you cannot trust anything that he says. Oh, and I also forgot to mention that he was also a member of the Amateur Dramatic Society, which um, makes sense, makes a hell of a lot of sense when you know what happens in this case. Malcolm does leave school at the age of 15 with no qualifications. And for quite a while, he just bounces from one job to the next, not really committing to anything, but what's the surprise there? And then he finally decides what career would be best for him. And that was a career in nursing. And again, this is obviously very, very significant, unfortunately. And the first job he got was in an old person's nursing home. And not long after Malcolm started working in this nursing home, things started disappearing. Of course they did. The kind of things that were disappearing were money, little trinkets, uh, jewelry, a diamond ring even went missing. Other just sentimental items, pretty much anything that had any kind of monetary value basically. And guess who stole all of these items? Malcolm. So that is another amazing quality to Malcolm's character here. He's also a thief. And apparently this was not actually a new thing for Malcolm. Apparently he'd actually been stealing things from people from very young, from when he was a child. But daddy being in the police force would always get him off. Malcolm would literally just phone up his dad and say, daddy, I'm in trouble, can you fix it? And I'm calling him daddy because Malcolm actually did used to call his dad daddy. And Malcolm would use all of these stolen items, stolen money and everything 
to buy the most ridiculous things. He would just go to the shops and blow all of the money on pretty much anything, the most random things. It's like he just had an addiction to buying things. Like he bought at one time multiple antique clocks. <laughs> it's like, okay, if you like clocks, go out and buy some clocks. But it's like, why do you need so many clocks? He would just buy the randomest things. And he was absolutely terrible with money. And he was always always in debt. He always was the kind of person that acted like he had a lot of money when he actually didn't. He would actually go into Harrods, which if you don't know what Harrods is, it's a very luxurious shop in London and everything is like crazy expensive, but I'm sure you all know what Harrods is. So he would literally just go into Harrods and spend money and act like he's this really rich person and have everyone in Harrods just like waiting on him. So you know that I said that he stole a diamond ring from one of the people in the old people's home. So he sold this diamond ring and he bought himself with the money that he made just a few vinyl records and golf clubs. I don't even think he golfed. He just had an addiction to consuming things, owning items. And then probably the worst quality of Malcolm's personality is that he liked to use and abuse people, especially women. So Malcolm has been described, I honestly don't know by who, but he has been described as a very charming, good looking person. Malcolm's aim was to use his charming personality to sweep women off their feet, but not with his true personality, obviously, because who would be attracted to that? He had this fake personality, this fake persona. One of the ways that Malcolm would charm the ladies was to fake illnesses to gain their sympathy. Malcolm would learn how to play on their emotions. He would change his tactics as well with every woman. He would learn what makes them tick, like what is their weaknesses almost. And he would use their emotions to manipulate them. And he was the biggest gaslighter I think I've ever come across. Malcolm went through a series of relationships in his 20s. None of them lasted too long, but there were two very significant relationships that ended in absolute tragedy. So the first one was actually when Malcolm was 17 and his girlfriend at the time was 15. And the girl was actually Malcolm's boss's daughter. So yeah, I don't know how that happened. And during their short relationship, the girl fell pregnant and Malcolm forced her to get an abortion. The implications that this had on that girl's life were monumental. She carried that guilt of the abortion for years and she kept it to herself as well. Like no one knew about the abortion, but this had a huge effect on her life, but Malcolm didn't care. Malcolm after their relationship just moved on. And then the second relationship that ended in absolute tragedy is that one of Malcolm's girlfriends shortly after they broke up committed suicide. Now at the time the death was ruled as a suicide and even after investigations were made later on, there was no evidence of foul play. However, given some of the things that happened in this case and given some of the things that Malcolm does, I think it's very hard to say that Malcolm wasn't responsible for that suicide. Like I think he had a role in that death. But tragedy seemed to follow Malcolm, which is 100% not a coincidence. And during Malcolm's 20s, he was also traveling quite a lot. He traveled to New Zealand, Australia, the Middle East, before finally settling in Abu Dhabi for a nursing job there. So Malcolm was working as a nurse in a children's hospital in Abu Dhabi. And at first, everything was going okay. Okay, it was a really good stable job for Malcolm. But then suddenly there were a number of very suspicious deaths in the hospital. Within a very short space of time, three children, all under the age of six, died of cardiac arrest. Now this is extremely rare in young children, and I mean extremely rare. The fact that three children in a very short space of time die from a cardiac arrest it was just too suspicious. It was too much to be a coincidence and an investigation was opened. And guess what? All three children were under the care of Malcolm Webster. Malcolm was sacked immediately, but the police struggled to build a case against Malcolm. They struggled to actually prove that he was behind the deaths. And then of course, daddy got involved, didn't he? He phoned his friends in higher places and got Malcolm back to the UK without any charges. So yeah, that is when, in a lot of people's opinion, 
Malcolm committed murder for the first time and got away with it. And unfortunately, to this day, it's actually never been determined what actually happened in that hospital. It's thought that Malcolm was injecting the children with excessive amounts of insulin. And the reason he was doing this is to practice killing people and getting away with it. Which, oh my God, if that is true, that he was using these innocent children to practice killing, oh my God, he's sick, like he's disgusting. So Malcolm arrives back in the UK. He is now in his 30s. And this is where things start to get very Tinder, Swindler-esque because Malcolm meets his first wife. So it's 1991 and Malcolm meets a woman called Claire Morris. Claire was currently 29 years old. She was training to be a nurse in London. And when she first met Malcolm, it's been described as love at first sight. Claire grew up in Kent and she had a pretty healthy, normal, stable, happy childhood and a very good education. And now she was training to be a nurse. And when she met Malcolm, she had never really been seriously in love before. However, Malcolm completely won her over. He put on his charming personality. He made her laugh. He made her feel safe. He made her feel comfortable. He also seemed like he had everything put together. He seemed like he was on a really good path, which of course he didn't. But in Claire's eyes, this is what she saw. She saw the Malcolm that Malcolm wanted her to see. And they did fall in love. Well, I should say Claire fell in love very quickly. It was a whirlwind romance. And before long, they were engaged and getting married. And they got married in a really lovely ceremony in Aberdeen in Scotland. And Malcolm played the part very well. He gave all of these nice speeches, very loving. He seemed very caring. Now for the, the cake. That was made by my dear wife. I hope that Claire never finds out about it. <laughs> pan, pan. She's got a microphone on. <laughs> oh, earthquake. So after the wedding, Malcolm and Claire settled down. They actually settled down in Aberdeen in Scotland. Apparently, this was the only place that Malcolm could get a job, which is not true. Malcolm just wanted to isolate Claire from her family and friends and move her to a very remote location. Now, Claire didn't find this suspicious at first, and she actually didn't mind because she loves Scotland. And both Malcolm and Claire did end up getting nursing jobs up in Aberdeen. And like I said, they were living in a very remote area. Neither one of them really knew anybody. They were there pretty much on their own. And this is when Malcolm actually started to show his true colors now that he had Claire completely isolated. Now, remember, Malcolm is absolutely terrible at money. Well, at this time, Claire didn't know that. He'd actually managed to hide it from Claire pretty well. But now that they were living together, Malcolm couldn't really hide his spending addiction. Claire started to become aware of this. She started to see the bills mounting up. She started to see all of the money leaving their bank accounts. And Claire was getting to a point where she was getting fed up. At the beginning, she kind of like let it slide. She was kind of like, okay, he's going to stop eventually. But he didn't, he kept on spending. And Claire was just getting really, really fed up. And she confronted Malcolm and she was like, listen, you need to stop spending. We have bills to pay, debt is mounting. But Malcolm couldn't really care less. He didn't care what Claire said. Instead, what Malcolm would do is that he would go out and buy Claire really nice, really lavish gifts. And then when Claire would confront him about spending too much, he would then turn around and say, how dare you? I have bought you this gift. You are so ungrateful. I was just doing something nice for you. And he would guilt trip the hell out of her and Claire would end up feeling really guilty. And Claire actually started to question whether she was in the wrong, whether she was the bad guy. And this is what I mean, gaslighting to the extreme. But Claire didn't let it drop. She wasn't about to let Malcolm just spend all of their money. She would continue to complain to Malcolm and they would continue to argue. And this is when Malcolm thought to himself, okay then, I need to find another way to keep you quiet. And this is when things start to escalate to a whole nother level. Not too long after the argument started between Claire and Malcolm about all of their money problems, Claire started to suffer a range of very strange symptoms. She was suffering with extreme fatigue and it just came out of the blue. There was no warning signs and she literally had zero energy to do anything and she would sleep all day, all night. She couldn't even do 
basic things around the house. And Claire started to worry because all of this just came on out of the blue and she started to talk to Malcolm because obviously Malcolm is a nurse, remember? I think Claire at this point was still training to be a nurse. I mean, she would obviously still have some knowledge, but she was talking to Malcolm and saying, what the hell is going on with me? Like, this is not normal. And she started telling him all of her symptoms. And she was saying to Malcolm, oh, I think I should go to the doctors and get some tests, try and figure out what was going on. But Malcolm was just really against the idea of her going to the doctors. Hmm, I wonder why. And Malcolm was just saying to Claire, no, don't go to the doctors. You don't need to go to the doctors. It's just a virus. It's a virus and it will pass. But what Claire didn't know is that it wasn't a virus at all. Oh, no, no. Malcolm was actually drugging Claire. It's like, can he stoop no lower? So to keep Claire quiet about all of their money problems, he was slipping drugs into her cup of tea. And he did this so Claire would be constantly drowsy, constantly confused, not really aware of what was going on around her so she wouldn't confront Malcolm about their money problems. And the drugs that Malcolm was giving Claire secretly were diazepam and temazepam. And these are very strong sedatives and both of them are normally drugs used to treat insomnia. And the whole time Malcolm was just continuing on to spend more and more money. The debt was rising and rising. And whenever Claire would bring up the topic of, oh, I think I need to go to the doctors. Like this is not going away. Malcolm would quickly deflect from the topic and say, oh no, 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 don't go to the doctors. It's just a virus. Here, have a cup of tea. That will make you feel better. And then her cup of tea would be laced with even more drugs. She would then drink the cup of tea, get really confused, drowsy, fall asleep and forget about their money problems. And it got to a point where Claire actually was really insistent that she needed to go to the doctors. She needed to get some blood tests. She needed to see what the how was going on. And she was really insistent this time. And Claire was just not putting up with this anymore because this had been going on for months. Her life had been completely ruined. She couldn't do anything. But Malcolm knew that if she went to the doctors, she would get a blood test and her test results would come back and show the diazepam and temazepam in her system. And Malcolm just couldn't allow that to happen. And he knew that he needed to put a stop to it. And unfortunately, his plan would end in absolute tragedy. A plan which Malcolm believed would solve two of his problems. The plan would get him out of debt and it would also prevent anyone finding out that he was drugging Claire. So shortly after Claire told Malcolm that she was adamant that she was going to go to the doctors, Malcolm made sure to take out life insurance policies on Claire. But he didn't take out just one insurance policy. Oh no. He took out a dozen. Mm -hmm. I'm not lying there. He took out 12 life insurance policies. Who needs 12 life insurance policies but also how is that allowed? And tragically, Malcolm only had one thing in his mind at this point, and that was that he was going to murder his wife, Claire. So on the night of the 27th of May, 1994, Malcolm gave Claire her usual cocktail of drugs in her cup of tea. And then at around midnight, he bundled Claire into their car. He then put a large canister of petrol in the car and he took Claire for a drive. But tragically, this was no ordinary drive because Malcolm was planning something way more sinister. Malcolm took Claire down a remote country lane that had quite a lot of bends in it. And when a particularly sharp bend came up, Malcolm failed to turn the wheel and the car just went flying off the road down an embankment and crashed straight into a tree. Sounds like a very terrible, accident, doesn't it? But it wasn't. Malcolm had intended on crashing into that tree. After the crash, Malcolm climbed out of the car. The car was completely smashed up. I mean, of course it was. They'd just driven into a tree. Malcolm left Claire in the passenger seat. She was completely out of it. She was so dazed. I mean, remember, she is completely drugged at this point. Now, Malcolm had created quite a scene. I mean, he had driven off the road, down an embankment, and straight into a tree. And even though this was quite a remote country lane, it was still quite busy, and there was a lot of passing traffic. So obviously, people had seen what had happened and a lot of people were stopping and asking Malcolm like are you okay do you need any help is there anyone else in the car and Malcolm was just like oh no 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 I'm completely fine like it's okay go on your way I don't need your help and there is no one else in the car once Malcolm was finally alone he took the petrol canister from the car he poured it 
over the car. The car burst into flames and another passerby saw what was going on. However, this passerby saw that there was someone in the passenger seat who was Claire, but it was too late. There was nothing that anyone could do at this point. The fire had completely taken over the car and tragically Claire lost her life. Her husband, Malcolm Webster, had murdered her. Following Claire's death, Malcolm was taken into the police station for questioning, but Malcolm was continuing to push the story of it was an accident. However, the police were suspicious. They were. Things just didn't add up. First of all, there were a number of witnesses that testified that Malcolm had specifically said to them that there was no one else in the car. Another passerby testified that when the car was on fire, Malcolm was making no attempt to get his wife out of the car. He didn't really seem very emotional. But then also the biggest suspicious thing is that there were no skid marks on the road. If the car really had lost control, there would be some indication of that on the road. But also the accident wasn't actually that bad and the accident wasn't bad enough to trap Claire in the car. So as far as the police are concerned, Claire should have been able to get out of the car herself. And also because the crash wasn't that bad, the car shouldn't have burst into flames. Actual firefighters testified that there is no way that that could have happened. And then there was also a petrol can found at the scene. And it was common knowledge that Malcolm's nickname was Pyro. <laughs> it's incredibly frustrating, isn't it? Because it literally is all there for everyone to see that Malcolm did this. But guess what? Daddy got involved, didn't he? And all the charges were dropped. So Malcolm just walked away. The investigation was closed and he even went to Claire's funeral. I mean, of course he did. He had to play the grieving husband, which I've got to say he played very well. And he even wore a neck brace, even though he didn't need it. It was just to get sympathy. And I've got to say, because now Malcolm is a widow, this was his favorite role. He loved this because this got him more sympathy than anything else that he could have come up with. So after Claire's funeral, Malcolm collected £200,000 in life insurance policy payouts. And there were no questions asked. <laughs> no questions asked of why he had 12 life insurance policies. That is another bit of evidence as well. It's like, why did the police not see that? So the first thing that Malcolm bought with the insurance money was a yacht. <laughs> I'm not even joking. He bought a yacht. It's like, who the hell does he think he is? I know £200,000 is a lot of money. I know, but... He bought a yacht. He bought a yacht. And within weeks of Claire's death, Malcolm was already out and about dating new women. And he would take the women out on dates on his yacht. I still cannot get over that he has a yacht. And he would take the women to fancy hotels, fancy restaurants, and he would drive them around in his brand new Range Rover. And what is just absolutely disgusting, this makes my blood boil, is that he would take his dates to Claire's grave. This man is on a whole nother level. Like I said, playing the widow was his favorite role. He loved the sympathy that he got. He would speak openly about the heartbreak of losing Claire. And Malcolm was burning through the insurance money very, very quickly. I mean, of course he did. He bought a bloody yacht and he was blowing through all this money basically just to show off to women. And it wasn't too long until all the money was gone. And again, this is what makes this case strikingly similar to the Tinder swindler because Malcolm was taking money from one woman and spending it on another one to impress them, manipulate them, and then take money off them and move on to the next woman. Because as soon as Malcolm had run out of money, he was now looking for his next victim. Malcolm is actually planning on doing all of this again. And I mean, all of it again. So in May of 1996, Malcolm is currently 37 years old. He meets a woman called Felicity Drum, who would soon become his second wife. Felicity was from New Zealand. She had a very good family. She was living her best life. She was really successful in her career as well. She was the definition of an independent woman. And then she met Malcolm. Malcolm and Felicity had first met each other when they were both traveling abroad for work. And when they met, as soon as Malcolm found out that Felicity was pretty financially well off, he was like, great. This is my target. And this is when Malcolm pretty much carries out the same thing that he did with Claire. He first won Felicity over by charming her with his 
extremely charming personality. He made Felicity feel like he was the perfect man. They had a whirlwind romance and within months they were engaged. And within a year of meeting, they were married. And then as soon as they tied the knot, Malcolm got up to his old tricks again. And I mean, literally, literally as soon as they tied the knot, because on the first night of their honeymoon, Malcolm had already begun drugging Felicity. On the first night, Felicity all of a sudden didn't feel very well. She felt like she had I don't know, a little bit of a bad head. She was feeling a bit lightheaded, drowsy, and she ended up sleeping for 36 hours. Now, when we look back at Malcolm and Claire's relationship, he didn't start drugging Claire straight away. He only started drugging Claire when Claire was becoming a problem for him. So I don't know if we can say for sure whether his intention with Claire was to kill her from day one, but I think, unfortunately, it's safe to say that with Felicity from day one, this was his plan. From day one, he was planning to murder her because he has not wasted any time at all. And of course, Felicity has absolutely no idea. She has just got these very strange, suspicious symptoms. She's feeling really tired all the time, drowsy, forgetful. And she just keeps asking Malcolm, what's wrong with me? What is going on? And Malcolm is just like, oh, it just seems like a virus. You'll be okay. Here's a cup of tea you'll feel better after. And months go by and Felicity is still feeling these symptoms. These symptoms are not going away. But the whole time this was going on, Malcolm was plotting her murder. He was trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to murder Felicity? How am I going to profit as much as I possibly can from her murder? And how am I going to get away with it again? However, just as Malcolm was putting his plans together, essentially, something happened that completely derailed his plans. And that is Felicity fell pregnant. And this was totally unplanned. So it took Malcolm by surprise. And when Felicity broke the news to Malcolm, she was expecting him to be excited, happy, you know, like the normal kind of feelings. But instead, he was furious, which is definitely not the right reaction. He was saying things like, we cannot have a child right now. We can't afford this. We're not ready. But the real reason why Malcolm was furious is because these plans had actually foiled his murder plan. Because it turns out that Malcolm could draw a line somewhere because he couldn't contemplate murdering his unborn child. And therefore his murder plan was delayed only delayed though. And actually Malcolm got excited about the pregnancy as soon as he found out he was having a son. And I think daddy issues come into play there a little bit. But even still, throughout the pregnancy, Malcolm continued to drug Felicity. Felicity continued to have all of these terrible symptoms throughout her pregnancy. She must have had a very rough pregnancy. However, thankfully, she actually did have a healthy birth and the two of them now have a child a son together. So after the birth of their son, Felicity wanted to move back to New Zealand, buy a house there and settle down there. And Malcolm was thinking, great, he was all for that because he was thinking, great, something else for me to inherit when you're gone. Because despite everything that had happened, despite her having a child with Malcolm, he was still planning on murdering her. But before Malcolm could do that, there were a lot of strange events that happened before, all of which included fire. Mm -hmm. Told you it would come back up. So first of all, after their son was born back in Scotland, there was a random fire at their home. Thankfully, no one was harmed, but a lot of Malcolm and Felicity's belongings were destroyed. So then Malcolm claimed on the home insurance. So that's like, okay, it seems suspicious to us, but it can happen, you know? So nobody was very suspicious at the time. And then when they were just about to move to New Zealand, all of their belongings were in a storage unit and out of the blue, the storage unit burned down. And of course, it wasn't a coincidence, was it? Because Malcolm Pyro Webster set both of those fires himself. And then he also claimed on the insurance of the storage facility, because obviously a lot of his belongings were also damaged in the storage unit. But what is the worst thing of all? Thankfully, no one was harmed in all of this, but technically they were because in the storage unit, it wasn't just Malcolm and Felicity's storage unit that was burnt down. It was everyone's. And can you imagine how many lives 
that could have destroyed. Malcolm just didn't care. He just set the whole thing on fire. And Malcolm was able to claim 68,000 pounds in insurance money because the storage unit had burnt down and an innocent employee was blamed for starting the fire which obviously they didn't. And that employee was probably fired. And it's just like, oh God, Malcolm just left, right and center is going around ruining people's lives. So like I said, thankfully no one was physically harmed, but people were still harmed. So after the warehouse fire, they moved to New Zealand. First of all, they go and live with Felicity's parents in their house whilst they try and find a house. And they actually do find a house very quickly, their dream home. And then all of a sudden there is a fire in the dream home. They haven't even bought it yet but there is a fire in the dream home. It's like, seriously, what are the chances? Why is no one clocking onto this? So basically Malcolm had set fire to the dream home to delay the sale of the dream home because he didn't have the finances straight away. And then randomly, a fire broke out at Felicity's parents' house. Again, this was started by Malcolm and it's actually speculated that this particular fire was started to actually murder Felicity. But thankfully, Felicity's dad woke up before the fire got too out of hand and was able to put it out. So that is four fires now. This case is incredibly frustrating because I feel like <laughs> The evidence is there. It's so obvious what is happening. Also, Malcolm is claiming insurance money left, right and center. <laughs> Why is no one clocking onto that either? But apparently there was somebody that was becoming suspicious of Malcolm and that is Felicity's dad. But the thing is, Felicity's dad at this point doesn't realize how bad Malcolm is. He knows that he is a dodgy person, but tragically he doesn't know that Malcolm has plans to murder his daughter. So Malcolm and Felicity were still trying to buy their dream home but Malcolm kept delaying the process kept saying oh I'll have the money soon like my money from Scotland will come through soon of course this was all complete BS there was no money Malcolm was just biding his time trying to figure out how to steal Felicity's money murder her escape and get away with it. So the first murder attempt happened when they were driving pretty much full speed on the motorway and Malcolm started saying to Felicity, oh, the steering wheel feels weird. Like the steering feels off. Like, oh my God, what is going on? And he was weaving all over the place. And Felicity was like, oh my God, what the hell are you doing? However, Felicity grabbed the steering wheel and managed to get the car onto the side of the road. And she was like, the steering feels fine. Like, what are you talking about? Malcolm was actually planning to swerve and crash the car somehow. And then Malcolm, because he'd obviously been caught out, the steering was completely fine. He started to grab his chest and started to complain of chest pains as if he's having a heart attack. Literally back up to his old tricks again. It's actually ridiculous. It really is. So they went to the hospital because they thought he was having a heart attack, which he obviously wasn't. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this man apart from his bloody brain. So that was the first murder attempt, but Malcolm did not stop there. So one afternoon, Malcolm told Felicity that he wanted to go out for a picnic in the woods with Felicity and their son. And Felicity was like, yeah, sure, whatever. You've got to remember as well, at this point, Felicity is still being drugged on pretty much a daily basis. So for most of the time, she's very drowsy, very out of it, very confused. And she's just like, okay, Malcolm, like whatever, whatever you say. So they drive out into the woods for a picnic. Malcolm pulls over. He tells Felicity that he's just going to take their son out for a walk, like to calm him down. And Felicity being very sleepy, very drowsy is just like, sure, whatever. She doesn't really know what's going on. But what Felicity didn't realize is that Malcolm had packed a large petrol canister in the boot of the car just before going out onto the picnic. He was planning on setting the car alight with Felicity inside the car. However, just as Malcolm was about to start pouring the petrol over the car, Felicity's dad starts phoning Felicity. Now, as we know, her dad was becoming very suspicious of Malcolm and he'd actually figured out what Malcolm's plan was. He'd figured out that Malcolm was planning to murder his daughter for insurance money. So as soon as he found this out, he phoned Felicity straight away 
Thankfully, even though Felicity is very drowsy, a phone ringing does seem to wake her up a little bit, bring her around and she answers the phone and her dad says to her, Felicity, don't listen to anything that Malcolm says. You need to come home straight away. It is an emergency. And Felicity could hear the panic in her dad's voice and it kind of snaps her out of her drowsiness. And Felicity shouts to Malcolm, we need to go home right now. My dad needs to see me. And Malcolm, who was literally minutes from setting this car alight, realizes that his plan has now been ruined. So Malcolm drives Felicity back home. So Felicity's dad, like I said, had figured out what Malcolm's plans was because when he was out of the house, Felicity's dad had started to go through some paperwork that was addressed to Malcolm. First of all, he saw bank statements that showed Malcolm transferring $200,000 from Felicity's account to Malcolm's account. There was also lots of paperwork because Malcolm had took out dozens of life insurance policies on Felicity's life. And then third, there was two plane tickets, one for Malcolm and one for his son to go back to Scotland, but there was no plane ticket for Felicity. So thankfully, Felicity's dad worked it out just in time what Malcolm was planning on doing, and he actually did save his daughter's life. And as soon as Felicity returned home from that picnic, her dad confronted Malcolm straight away. Of course, Malcolm now knew that he had been caught red-handed. He had been caught, there was no way that he was actually going to be able to murder Felicity now. So what did he do? He ran away and he ran all the way back to Scotland. But before he did run away, Malcolm said one last thing to Felicity. And he said, quote, I gave you a good life and a son. You would have died happy. Really? Like she's supposed to be thankful for him and what he was going to do. It's literally, he's delusional. That is what he is. Now, I'm sure you're probably thinking, great, this is the end of the story. He's been caught red handed. There is no way that he can get away with this now. And you would be wrong, unfortunately. So it turns out that Malcolm managed to flee New Zealand and go back to Scotland before the police could gather enough evidence to actually arrest him. So Felicity was left with two choices. They could either get him extradited back to New Zealand to face trial, or they could get his passport blocked so he could never enter New Zealand again. If he was found not guilty at trial, which to be honest is probably highly likely in the case of Malcolm, he would have full access to Felicity and their son. However, if his passport was blocked, that would mean that he would never have access to Felicity and her son ever again. So Felicity felt like she only had one option. So she chose for his passport to be blocked. And to be honest, I don't blame her. However, there was one thing that Felicity did to hold power over Malcolm. She refused to divorce him. She refused to allow him to do this to another woman. But unfortunately, that didn't stop Malcolm from trying. Oh no, because unfortunately, we still have one more victim to talk about. So Malcolm had set his sights on his next victim, who was a 41-year-old woman called Simone Banerjee. And she worked as a nurse in Scotland. After Malcolm had fled New Zealand and returned back to Scotland, he managed to get a job as a nurse in a hospital. It's like, seriously, why? Why, why? And he got a job at the same hospital as Simone. So they were working together and this is how they got to know each other. And at first Simone wasn't interested in Malcolm, but this did not deter Malcolm at all. He had already decided that Simone was going to be his next victim. And he chose Simone because he found out that she was pretty wealthy and he was gonna do whatever he could to win her over. But remember, this is Malcolm here. He's not gonna use like the usual tactics to win someone over, like just being a nice person. He was gonna use sympathy to win Simone over. So he pretended to have cancer, just when you thought he couldn't stoop any lower. And he literally pulled out all the stops here. He pretended that he was having chemo. He shaved his head, he shaved his eyebrows. And there are actual pictures of him when he was pretending to have chemo. It's just like, what the hell? And unbelievably, Malcolm's plan worked. All of this emotional manipulation made Simone fall for Malcolm. And it wasn't too long until Malcolm proposed to Simone, even though he's still married. Obviously, Simone doesn't know this, but yeah, he's still married to Felicity. Malcolm even bought Simone a £6,000 engagement ring. And where did he get that money, you ask? He bought it using the $200,000 that he stole from Felicity. I told you he was the Tinder swindler before the Tinder swindler. And then Malcolm managed to convince Simone to change her will and leave him 
all 300,000 pounds of assets to him. So I think it's pretty clear what Malcolm's intentions are at this point, isn't it? However, what Malcolm didn't realize is that secretly the police were onto him. Felicity was not about to let Malcolm get away with anything and she tipped off the police in Scotland. And thankfully the police in Scotland took Felicity's accusations seriously. And the police at this point were 100% convinced that he was planning to murder Simone. But what is the most annoying thing is that there wasn't enough evidence. The police were not able to warn Simone because there was no evidence. I mean, to me, I'm not a police officer, okay, but it does seem like there is enough evidence, but I do understand that these things have to be done properly and they don't want to jump the gun and do it too quickly and then let Malcolm get away again. They have to build the proper case. And of course, Malcolm was planning to kill Simone. The police were 100% correct because at that very moment, Malcolm was planning a boat trip with Simone and he was planning on killing Simone on this boat trip. He had actually sabotaged her life jacket and he was clearly planning to set up some kind of accidental drowning in some way. But the police were not gonna let this happen. Even though they didn't have enough evidence yet, they still turned up at the boatyard to let Malcolm know we're watching you, we're on to you. And thankfully this did prevent Malcolm from carrying out the murder. And then I don't quite know how much time passed, but a significant amount of time did pass. And then finally the police had enough evidence to tell Simone that he was planning on killing her. And when Simone first heard this news, she was absolutely astounded. She was just like, no, no, you've got it wrong. You've got the wrong person. She didn't believe it at first, but she didn't want to believe it at first. But then when she started to think about it, everything started to fall into place and she started to think of all of the weird things about Malcolm and the fact that she had signed everything over to him in her will, the fact that they were engaged but the wedding was nowhere in sight. And when she confronted Malcolm about this, he just ran away again. So I'm sure now you're thinking, okay, great. The police know about him. He gets arrested, he gets charged and he goes to prison. But no, because unfortunately it is not that simple. It should be but it's not. They didn't have enough evidence to charge him. They had enough evidence to tell Simone to warn her, but they didn't have enough to charge him, which seems absolutely crazy to me because he's been leaving breadcrumbs here, there and everywhere for literally decades. However, what the police did do was reopen the investigation into Claire's death. And finally, 14 years after Claire's death, Malcolm Webster was charged with her murder. He was also charged with the attempted murder of his second wife, Felicity, and attempting to bigamously marry Simone. Overall, the investigation into Malcolm took over five years and involved, get this, over a thousand people being interviewed. It was also the longest trial for a single individual in Scottish history. But thankfully, at the end of the trial, Malcolm Webster was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years. And honestly, it's just absolutely crazy, isn't it, that it took that long. <laughs> it took so long. When you look back at this case, it's just crazy how long he was getting away with everything for. And I'm not just talking about the murder of Claire, I'm talking before Claire. I'm talking about those suspicious deaths of the children in the Abu Dhabi hospital. He has never been charged with that. I don't even think an investigation has been opened into that. And I think we need to remember the biggest reason why he got away with all of this for as long as he did and that was daddy. It was known that Malcolm's dad made contact with the Scottish police after Claire's death. And it was also known that Malcolm's dad contacted the foreign office to get Malcolm out of those suspicious deaths in Abu Dhabi. However, Malcolm's dad passed away before Malcolm was even arrested. So the involvement of Malcolm's dad will probably never be known. But I think it's safe to say that without Malcolm's dad, Malcolm would have been caught a lot earlier. But even after Malcolm was sent to prison, there have been more articles that have surfaced that think Malcolm may be responsible for more murders. There is strong suspicion that he is linked to a murder that happened in Australia. But I don't really know any details about that murder. It's not really known, but it's just crazy to think how many victims did this man have? We only know of the ones that I've spoken about in this video, but he got away with so much. It would not surprise me if there are more victims out there and maybe Maybe not even people that he murdered, just more victims that he took advantage of. Because he was a serial offender, he could not help himself. The money that he would steal from one woman, he would use that money to then manipulate another woman and get more money out of her. Very much 
like the Tinder Swindler. I know I've said that so many times, but this literally is Tinder Swindler to the extreme. But I personally don't think that Malcolm set out to be a Tinder Swindler. I don't think he set out to take advantage of women, like marry them, take all their money and then merge them. I don't think he actually set out to do that. I personally think that Malcolm just set out to take advantage of anyone he could. You've got to remember the first job that Malcolm ever took, which was a nursing job in an old people's home old people, very vulnerable. I think that this is very significant, I do, because I think Malcolm possibly thought, my victims are going to be old people. They're very vulnerable, I can steal from them, they won't know, possibly get them to leave me things in their will. And I think he was gonna go down that route. But then he met Claire, and obviously we all know how that turned out. He took advantage of her, he murdered her, and then he got away with it. And I think in that moment, he realized that he could do this multiple times and get away with it. And it was actually more profitable to do it that way than to steal off old people. Malcolm is definitely not your typical killer or serial killer, whatever you wanna call him. I don't think that he was driven to kill. He didn't have a particular victimology either. I mean, if you look at his victims, we have children, we have women of all ages, and we have old people. He doesn't have a particular victimology. All of these people, most of them were vulnerable, but all of them were just convenient for him. Malcolm wasn't getting a high from the kill. He was getting a high from chasing the money and getting away with it. Either way, he's a terrible person. You guys just know that I like to try and dive into their mind and figure them out. And yeah, either way, he is a psychopath. He really is. And the real takeaway from this case is the tragic loss of Claire. Claire was only 32 years old when she was murdered. She was so incredibly young. She had so much ahead of her. She was training to be a nurse. She has been described as a bundle of joy, a light in everyone's life. She was always so happy, willing to help. She just always had this cheeky little grin on her face that would light up a room and everyone that knew Claire, but particularly her mom, dad, and brother were absolutely devastated that she was taken from them far too soon. And that is the case of Malcolm Pyro Webster, which is just an incredibly frustrating case. I do blame his dad, I do, equally I do, because without his dad, who knows when he would have been stopped. He probably would have been stopped um, when he killed the children in Abu Dhabi. Hopefully he would have been caught sooner than that. So let me know all of your thoughts, theories and opinions. I want to know them all. And also let me know what your case suggestions are because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget you can get your free one month trial using the link in my description box. And that is it from me. I hope you all have a really good week ahead and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.